bit of a head of water in here, but not much. Uh, so there's a real need to get the uh, water levels higher on the main stream. Um, if, you, if you want to have a quick look at this, um, well, it probably is around about 18 inches at present there, which should keep us going for you know an hour or so maybe as it all poured through and uh, turned the wheels. Um, I'll show you the wheels in a minute, but if you want to come over here now to the uh, older part of it. Built here since 1303, um, and we don't know without further archaeological studies um, which bits fit where, but it's likely that this bit here, this part of the mill, uh, this is the, uh, nor uh, the uh, northern part, northern mill, if you like, of the two mills, <coughs> this part here was probably, because the mill sat on the river, this was probably uh, the original mill, um, because the river is over here, and the, there will have been a channel, an overflow going down here, and that's evidence really by the fact that there's the remains of a pier but this uh, wall here this stone wall butts up to a, a uh, shaped uh, pier so it's likely that the river did bisect it as it went through here um, there's a single spoke wheel in there which we'll see later the single spoke wheel is uh, quite a rare feature but unfortunately for this mill it's not that rare because there's another one at Rosset Mill which I believe you've already photographed. But as you can see from the sandstone it's quite an old structure, uh, again not dated. Uh, what I'm looking at now is a grain drying kiln or what's left of it. Internally there's, there's, there will have been or would have been at one point a, a place where you would put in anthracite or charcoal and then there will have been a shelf or a floor, complete floor of perforated tiles, clay tiles likely. Uh, the grain is put on top of the tiles when the heat then dry and the heat then dries them and just like in a molster I suppose you shovel them over until the grain's in the right um, with the right level of humidity. That's especially for oatmeal because oatmeal if you just put it straight into the stones with it, it has a high uh, water content is likely to make porridge which isn't very good you know because it will clog up the entire machinery. Yeah, that's what remains of a um, millstone. It's the uh, Southern Mill, uh, which is which last actually operated in 1952. Um, a swimmer, boy swimmer, came and got caught in the paddles, and the miller, then fairly elderly, had to smash the paddles to get him out to save him. And in fact, um, it still works. It has no paddles on at present but I can work it just by moving it, um, mo moving the machinery inside to get the whole of this huge wheel moving. It would have required quite a bit of water, you know, it's a big wheel as you'll see later, it's an 18 foot wheel um, and even though wheels aren't very um, efficient, an efficient way of converting water into energy, when this moves this really gets the whole thing going and would have run at one point three sets of grindstones which we still have upstairs. And the drift is uh, an area, well a covered area, um, so that the uh, grain can be offloaded uh, without the rain falling on it and uh, causing problems. Carts will come into here and then a chain will be dropped from above and tied round each individual uh, sack and then hoisted up and through the uh, trap doors there, where the miller's waiting to actually weigh it, as we'll see later, and then put it into the system to either store it or actually send it through to the grindstones on the next floor down. Yeah, so this is the, the top end of the trap door. This is the top floor of the mill. The grain sacks will come up uh, and They'll be hoisted up with the mechanism that's actually above us and behind uh, the camera there. Uh, and when the sacks come right up here, the trap doors will slam shut and the miller will put them on probably a little trolley, a little porter's trolley. And then he'll bring it over here to a balance which should be uh, hanging from there, which in fact is in, in, in the ground floor. And then weigh it. And once weighed, He'll then take a ledger out of this desk, which probably the camera may not pick up, 
and write down the name of the farmer, the, name, the, the, the weight of the, of the grain, the type of grain and so on. And the ledger will be kept there, the miller's ledger. As I say, the um, mechanism is above uh, to hoist it and there's a, a neat arrangement right behind you now if you want to pan around to it. This in fact is, uh, there'll be a constant movement um, below and when the miller wants to engage, he pulls a rope from where he is behind us, which then engages this, just like a mower uh, machine, a uh, mower clutch, if you like, and the old DAF clutches that were made by uh, DAF in those silly little cars uh, made in the Netherlands about 40 years ago, I think. Once the grain is up here, it is then loaded into holes like this one, just underneath us here and the sacks will be poured into there and they'll wait in the hopper below uh, to go through the milling machinery which we'll go and see now. And what we've got here actually are um, two halves on my left and two halves on my right of an old barrel sieve. This sieve will have been uh, put together, two halves are put together as you can see there to make one cylinder they are in fact quite an interesting relic. Uh, they were patented, we know, in 1865, uh, 1865 in Manchester. And what happens is the grain goes in at the top, the barrels, the cylinder moves around and brushes on the inside, brush the uh, grain through the sieve, uh, leaving the, uh, you know, the, the unwanted parts of the grain to just fall down the other end and then be disposed of. Over here, this, this little uh, bit of graffiti here, is in fact uh, the symbol of Thomas Fernihoff. There's the T, and of course that right hand side will be the F. Thomas Fernihoff was a miller here in the uh, 18th, I believe, century, and uh, certainly um, was quite, he, he was quite the man round here. His body is to be found in uh, Plenstall Church's uh, graveyard. Uh, quite an elaborate structure, um, but Thomas Fernihoff was one of the literally, literally hundred or more millers that have been in this uh, on this site uh, since it was first a mill, we know in 1303, so that's 705 years of uh, uninterrupted uh, milling until, well it's not quite that because it, it all ended in 1952. Uh, this uh, truss here is typical of this mill but of, of many mills. Because it was an industrial structure it was made um, to accommodate uh, the industrial practices of the miller. Instead of having one beam going right throughout here and of course if there was that the miller would have to be all the time uh, bending down to get underneath it. They built it so that the strength is um, translated up from a beam that's underneath here because each of these is bolted to a beam that runs uh, transversely across the building and the strength is then supported or rather the weight is supported by the strength of these, uh, these, these particular upright posts. All in oak um, and quite, a, quite an impressive structure really, expensive structure by the Earls of Shrewsbury uh, who uh, owned this mill until 1917 for several hundred years. Uh, this is the uh, stones floor and we'll see the stones in a moment. I've just mentioned uh, the uh, way that the uh, trusses are supported above and bolted from below. This, these are the bolts in fact. As you can see that beam runs right across there. It's pretty substantial. It's not going to move anywhere and it keeps the whole um, structure absolutely solid. Now beneath my feet here and above my head are the trap doors. The, as the grain um, drops down through the machine, it will, uh, machinery it will end up on the bottom floor at which point it has to come back up again right to the top floor so that it can be offloaded into the carriages. And as you can see these trap doors open, each of them opens as the sack comes up and they'll open like that as the sack comes up and as the sack passes they'll automatically fall like that and then the sack will go on up through there and the same thing again 
the banging of the trap doors will be a typical sound that you would hear. The, next, the other sound you're going to hear, of course, is accompanied by the wobble of the whole building as the water goes through the uh, hole, uh, as the water wheel gyrates uh, the other side of that wall. What we've got here are the three sets of stones. And if you uh, have a quick look at the stones, or rather the casings of the stones, the wooden casings, the, the tons, they, you see number one over there, number two over there, number three here. And this is a very, very industrial way of, uh, of actually giving the stones names. It, it's unlikely that in a normal country mill you'll have this sort of thing. And that also reflects the ownership of the Earls of Shrewsbury. And it's possible that um, Thomas Telford uh, actually was involved in um, one way or another in, in the milling operations of the Shrewsbury family, along with another famous uh, engineer of the, uh, or rather famous metal worker of, of the uh, 18th century, uh, who was uh, Hazel Dean, who helped Thomas Telford with the Ponce Silt Aqueduct in North Wales, which uh, features a, a metal trough taking the Shropshire Union Canal, the flank off the branch of the Shropshire Union Canal, over the River Dee. The three sets of stones here. We've got the hoppers. I was talking about the hoppers before. They'll receive the grain from above. The grain will sit here until these gates are open. If you'd like to move over this way. Make sure this trap door's closed. Yeah, it will be, don't worry. You can see it is. <laughs> these gates are open and the grain will start to come through. The drive below of this shaft, causing it to rotate along with the top stone of the two stones that are here, will make this particular thing um, knock from side to side. It's called a maiden because it chatters. It's a terrible old miller's joke. Uh, but that's the grain comes through and it goes into the two stones. There are two stones, the bottom of which is static, the top one is the one that moves. It moves obviously due to the water power and we'll see how uh, the, the uh, motion of the big wheel is transferred into the turning motion of this top um, stone. The stones are huge and heavy and of course every now and again they need maintenance. And a block and pulley attached to here will pull the top stone up so that the miller can then dress the stones with a chisel really I suppose and a mallet which will put the grooves in again. The grooves that will take uh, the grain from the centre of the stones out into the uh, outside of the stones and then down uh, by gravity down into sacks below. The main post here is going to turn, and these wooden um, teeth uh, are there. They're wooden because um, if they were to be metal, metal on metal might cause sparks. Sparks in where there's a lot of flour dust about will actually cause uh, the whole thing to go up like a like a little bomb because uh, the flour dust is actually as flammable as, uh, well, quite as flammable as, as petroleum uh, vapour. Anyway, so we have here uh, one of the um, drive shafts, which actually, uh, we don't know what this used to run, but it would, the, the belt here, this will turn, and then there'll be a belt attached to it, and that belt will either go up to the top floor, or more likely to this floor, and will drive something like a dressing machine which will uh, clean and separate the grain uh, so that they, they have a better product. The other side, there you can see the belt hanging loose. That belt uh, is the belt uh, to drive the, the sack hoist above. Now that is uh, permanently connected to um, to this cog here, it's permanently connected, or oh, in fact to the central one there, it's permanently connected and this is what supports it.
they're quite simple structures really um, in many ways but uh, and, and one, one of the things about them is that all this wood if it were metal it would require and, and were to uh, break uh, it would require recasting and various other specialist services that's why most of it was wood because the miller would be a, a joiner a bodger a carpenter virtually anything that you know he would make himself in his little um, his little workshop that would have been somewhere about the mill we don't know where so it actually is he's been a maintenance man as well he's a maintenance man he does everything uh, all three of these um, and you'll see this below as well all three of the sets of machinery are different in many different ways they they look the same but if you look more closely uh, there are examples of um, posts there are examples of um, well, all sorts of stuff, the, 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 the um, shoots here and sieves and various other things, they're all different. They're probably got from like bring and buy sales or mill sales throughout the countryside. The, the miller would go there and would, uh, would, would find what he could uh, or make what he could, find what he couldn't make. Pigeons have got a lot to answer for really, but um, quite a big wheel as you can see. The shaft going through there was actually um, put there in the 1970s when the entire building was renovated by United Utilities, uh, who are the owner of the building. Um, but it was renovated in the 70s by the North West Water, um, who uses Manpower Services Commission uh, labour. But one of the big things, one of the tragedies of it, is they did not um, record the changes that they made and the, worse still, the things they got rid of uh, because they're, we're having to go on uh, clues um, left on beams and various other places to find out what was where and when and how everything worked. In the, uh, the oldest mill almost certainly, um, the one or two little bits of evidence that this is the, the oldest of the two mills. Um, one of the things you can pick up from here is the teeth, a wooden, and you break a tooth and there'll be several down below in the workshop uh, that the miller will make ready to just slot into place so that we can start the whole process again. If we look at the floor here, what we've got here are the uh, elm uh, floorboards and, and at one point, um, instead of this uh, tongue and groove we can see here, modern tongue and groove, uh, we will, will have had this um, elm flooring right throughout and as you can see the elm flooring is, it hasn't got nails, the conventional nails like you can see there, but there are little uh, wooden pins uh, which go into the, um, in, into the bits below. The supporting joists. Yeah, that'll do. I'm just looking at this a little bit of patchwork there, which is typical of what the miller will have done. We can have a quick look from above at uh, the single spoke wheel. The, this is the single spoke wheel that uh, I talked about before. That uh, has a. There's another one at Rosset Mill, which is um, you know another mill that you've looked at. Um, in fact, it's. As you can probably see from its state of repair, it's probably not moved for uh, 100, 150 years. In fact, it's with a bit of WD-40, certainly a lot of three-in-one, we could take it apart because it's in sections as long as uh, we, we then replaced, obviously, the spokes with um, decent oak or elm spokes, if we can find them <coughs> uh, or fashion them. Um, in fact, it's, it's quite an interesting um, wheel. It would have looked like a series of shovels really, that, that, that's what the, um, the paddles would have looked like and um, it was a, a technology which came over from France in the uh, 17th century I think or certainly the 18, early 18th century. Basically the uh, engine room if you like of the mill. What we've got uh, is the machinery, it's called hursting or the hearst floor, you've got the machinery that supports and turns um, everything that's up above. 
it's well supported as you can see the structure is a really strong oak structure which is carefully pieced together for the three sets of stones that are above uh, this as you'll see reaches out from the main uh, area and that's because it supports this set of stones right above it the what you see here again these are wooden spokes which go into the metal over there what you see here is a stone nut. Now, in order to engage the stone nut, all the miller does is pushes this up here. I don't think I can do it. A lot of strength today. It pushes. Oh, it's, it's not. It, you get the idea. It engages with the uh, hog up above, and then a pin is put through the shaft to keep it there. And once that's engaged, the miller will then, because he's built up a sufficient head of water, the miller will move over to uh, his, the sluice gate mechanism over there, which is just simply a handle this side. He'll open up the sluice gate, the water will start coming through, the great big wheel will turn, and that will turn everything uh, that you see around here, and the whole place will start wobbling, will start moving, you're standing on jelly. This is partly because, in fact, this whole building is, uh, the foundations of this whole building are an oak raft, a single oak raft running around, and we're actually on sli uh, slipping sands and peat. But then, when this, the grain starts coming through, it will come through let's say down to this hopper here and you'll open the gate and the grain will pour out into the sacks. All around you will be uh, the noise of the mill, of the water wheel, of the water coming through, of the machinery turning and the, the sound, the lighter sound of the grain coming through. The miller will then use his thumb, the famous miller's thumb that you hear about in Chaucer where this is a delicate instrument, which in Chaucer, of course, the miller uses for um, purposes of frolicking with, with various ladies. It's a sensitive instrument because it actually picks up the, whether the grain is in fact of the right consistency. And so the miller's thumb has been used for a millennia uh, you know, as the first testing mechanism. Uh, and then, if it's right, it will be sent back up uh, the trapdoor here sent right up to the top where it will be stored until the cart arrives again. What we've got here is the uh, northern end uh, and this in fact is fairly old and will take a lot of uh, renovation because over 150 years of neglect have, have allowed some of it to slip and, and to go out of alignment. It would take quite a bit to do this. Uh, also, there might be rot in some of the um, wooden structures we've got here um, and some of the beams in the, uh, that we see over there. In fact, what it was, this curious thing here, used to be a, uh, an oatmeal separator. It, it actually was encased by a wooden structure which is in front of us and worked like a hairdryer really um, over the grain. So, it would blow away the lighter bits that you didn't want uh, or you did want and allow the heavier bits just to, to fall into the unwanted sack. But lots is missing, lots, a lot of things missing there, take a lot of uh, work to do to put it right. The mill uh, will have survived by being part mill and part small holding uh, so there have been cattle on this area that I'm standing on now and may have been uh, we have no historical records but this is us uh, reinventing the past if you like it may have included uh, vegetable areas in fact this is the mills kitchen garden or at least phase one of it phase two is over here and as you can see from phase one we've already started this was first ploughed uh, early this season but uh, one way or another volunteer work has meant that uh, there's been quite a bit of progress really over the time 
and it will become a teaching garden uh, and possibly as well when uh, the mill is uh, made into an educational resource centre it will also have uh, for instance uh, it will produce produce for uh, the cafe that we're going to have. So which building is the cafe going to be in? It will be in the area of agricultural building uh, which is this side, the southern side of the two mills so it's the area that used to be agricultural building anyway. Okay, so that's the building closest to the entrance driveway? Yep, that's the one. Well, as we can see, some nice leeks and sprouting broccoli and Swiss chard. And we've already had potatoes and uh, beetroot and beans. So, lovely area, really.